Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today, we are now in day 138 of the uh, ongoing war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. Specifically, we're looking at a couple of different uh, things uh, today. Uh, most importantly is the talk of an impending Ukrainian counteroffensive, most likely uh, in between uh, Zaporizhia, up here kind of in the uh, central area of the conflict, the central southeastern area of the conflict, and more likely than not in the direction of uh, from Mykolaiv towards the city of Kherson. And we continue to hear talk that the Ukrainian military has uh, a force now of more than a million personnel in its uh, total armed forces composition to include roughly 700,000 personnel in its ground forces. Now the question is right now, uh, are the Ukrainians going to have the ability to assemble the, the size force necessary to evict the Russian forces from the western bank of the uh, Dnieper River, and that's this area right here in question. Now, there's two uh, there's two ways this could could possibly unfold uh, in terms of what the Ukrainians are planning. I doubt we will see a major offensive operation on the eastern side of the uh, Dnieper River in the direction towards Zaporizhia. Uh, most likely, we will see uh, some sort of uh, limited uh, counteroffensive uh, coming uh, from uh, northeast of Mykolaiv along this route here towards the uh, uh, the uh, western bank of the Dnieper River, and or continued assault by uh, Ukrainian forces uh, down this major highway uh, out of uh, Posad something that I'm just not even going to try to pronounce because I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong. I just am and I'm going to, I'm going to hear about it. So again, uh, you know, what would that look like? Do the Ukrainians even have the capability to mount uh, such an operation? Now the problem for the Ukrainians really is the terrain uh, that we're looking at west of Kherson. Look, very, very flat, open farmland that really kind of necessitates mobile warfare, mechanized warfare. You are going to need tanks, you're going to need an armored infantry fighting vehicles, you're going to need, at, at times, you're going to need to move fast in, ver in, in a very aggressive manner. You're not going to be able to use waves of uh, infantry. I mean, they could try that, but that is probably not going to work out very well for the Ukrainians. Now, one thing we, we can anticipate that we will see from the Ukrainians, and I think we're starting to see that now, is the use of uh, some of the more precision guided weapon systems that have been delivered by the uh, Western power, specifically the United States, the United Kingdom, and other NATO partners centered on the uh, HIMARS. And what these uh, long-range, very, very precise rocket systems will be able to do will be to target the bridges and pontoon bridges that the Russians have established across the Dnieper River, and that is going to allow the Ukrainians to negate uh, Russian uh, reinforcements and, more importantly, the supplies that would continue into the western uh, bank of the Dnieper River. So, if uh, the Ukrainians uh, right now are in possession of the HIMARS, which we know they are, and the question is, is uh, do they have the precision-guided rockets that are associated with the HIMARS that would allow precise engagements uh, of the bridges coming across the Dnieper River, and you're looking at one right there, and that is one of the bridges that is just to the uh, kind of the uh, north east of uh, of uh, Hersan proper. Then you have another bridge farther upstream to the north, and then uh, also you have to take into consideration uh, the possibility of additional bridges that the Russians could have constructed, but. The Ukrainians will, in all likelihood, continue to target uh, the uh, the Russian supply infrastructure that is feeding its forces 
uh, west of the uh, of the Nepper River, and that could allow for some limited success in theory uh, by Ukrainian forces if they have the ability to one maintain some sort of uh, air protection uh, of its forces with the use of uh, air defense systems. Now, obviously, we've heard reports that they may re be receiving more advanced. Uh, air defense systems, surface-to-air missiles specifically. There's talk that they could receive the ground-launched version of the AMRAAM. And uh, on top of that, obviously, the Ukrainians do possess S-300s and other systems that have made it difficult for uh, Russian fixed-wing aircraft to operate freely over the uh, western portions of uh, Ukraine. But the real issue for the Ukrainians is the concept that they would have to execute a, in all likelihood, a multi-brigade mechanized operation with large amounts of armored vehicles and tanks uh, to uh, uh, get to the outskirts of Kherson and then launch what would have to be, more or less, is a infantry assault uh, to clear out Russian forces uh, inside of Kherson. And uh, given the status of the, uh, the Ukrainian military and uh, kind of what we're seeing in terms of uh, uh, how the Ukrainian military has been degraded over the course of the last uh, uh, several weeks, several months, few months, uh, the likelihood that the Ukrainians could execute an offensive uh, and retake Kherson at the current moment is uh, is fairly remote. Again, we'll we'll probably see some strikes by the Ukrainian military with the use of HIMARS that uh, are going to cause the Russians some grief in terms of supplying its forces on the western bank of the Kherson River. But uh, uh, do the Ukrainians have that ability to launch such a massive offensive that they would push the Russians out of this area? Probably not at this point, and uh, I think that's a tall order. We do know that uh, obviously there has been some uh, propaganda coming out of the, uh, the senior leadership of Ukraine, specifically the office of the president, uh, stipulating that he has authorized uh, a counteroffensive in uh, southern Ukraine against Russian forces, but again. Uh, he can do that all day long, but ultimately, does the uh, Ukrainian army have the capability to launch such a counteroffensive? And right now, I'm going to have to go with the more prudent assessment, which is no. And I think uh, some of the decision-making processes on, in terms of the political, the senior political leadership of the Ukrainian uh, uh, leadership uh, has resulted in probably some unnecessary casualties. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the hold at all cost order near several Donetsk and uh, Lysychansk uh, probably resulted uh, in some fairly significant casualties for Ukrainian forces that uh, maybe not talked about as much uh, as, uh, as as probably should, but obviously the Ukrainians are not going to do that, and as are the Russians uh, themselves. Now, we are starting to hear that as many as 7,000-plus uh, 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 Ukrainian uh, military personnel have uh, been listed as missing in action. Uh, are they prisoners? Have they been KIA'd? Have they just been blown up? Uh, probably all, all three. But we do know... Uh, the uh, the casualty levels for Ukrainian forces are fairly significant at this stage, and part of that is some of the uh, the decision making process of the political leadership uh, intervening in the military decision making process, which may have led to uh, some uh, excessive casualties on Ukrainian forces. But uh, right now, in terms of the Russians, we are continuing to watch uh, this methodical campaign by Russian forces. Again, you can kind of see exactly uh, this map is, uh, I, I think, fairly accurate. Now, obviously, the Russians may control uh, more areas, especially this area in beige and, and quite possibly even further. Uh, this uh, map uh, tends to be more or less supportive of the Ukrainian side of the equation versus the Russian side. So, so obviously, uh, it's just it's just the way this map is at this point. 
But uh, as I talked about before, we're going to continue to see the Russians rolling up Ukrainian forces, especially uh, the uh, very, very close uh, to the uh, Nepper West Bank of the Nepper River line. That's this area here. And that, again, as I talked about in the previous video, would allow the Russians not to have to uh, launch a forced river crossing and at some point we'll probably see the line get pushed up along the M3 this major uh, road here and uh, going all the way towards Slovyansk and the same here I think that is the Russian strategy is to get continue to push along the western bank of the Dnieper River until they uh, Till they have the, the capacity to to cross uh, unmolested. Now, obviously, the Ukrainians uh, still may have the ability to target Russian forces with some of the uh, long-range, uh, multiple launch rocket systems and heavy artillery. Uh, but uh, direct uh, uh, anti-tank guided weapon t weapons teams that could be posted, and more importantly, some of those uh, uh, reconnaissance elements that uh, would call for real-time calls for fire against uh, a Russian uh, uh, river crossing over the Donets may not be present uh, if the Russians are allowed to continue to press along this uh, western bank uh, in the direction uh, south of Izum, this direction, and then obviously uh, east to west uh, from Lysychansk towards Slovyansk in this direction at this point. But right now we're going to continue to monitor the reports of this possible uh, Ukrainian counterattack. You can't discount it, but it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see what the capabilities of the Ukrainian military really are and if they are actually able to launch a counterattack. Uh, it would seem like at this stage, probably not. Now, at the same time, we do know, and let me go back to this other map here, that uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian forces are being allowed to go to uh, other countries. Uh, thousands are reportedly in the United Kingdom uh, actively training to include also uh, Poland and uh, possibly other countries such as Romania as well. And that, that allows those Ukrainian forces to train unmolested. Uh, Ukrainian forces are still training inside of Ukraine, uh, but when they do that, uh, that allows Russian forces to launch these cruise missile attacks on these training sites. And we have seen a number of uh, barracks and uh, a possible more uh, clandestine sites that the Ukrainian, Ukrainians have been utilizing as training sites. Uh, being targeted by Russian forces. Uh, for, unfortunately, some of these appear to be uh, civilian objects uh, that have been targeted by Russian forces, uh, but at the same time, they have been, at some of these sites, have been repurposed for military use, uh, given that many Ukrainian actual military bases uh, have been hit and reduced by Russian forces. Thus, the Ukrainians have had to move some of its training locations uh, to uh, former civilian sites, and then that gives the opportunity for the Ukrainians to claim that uh, the Russians are targeting civilian infrastructure, which I guess you could say they are, but they are dual-use facilities, meaning there has been cases where the Ukrainians were using these sites for the training and storing of weapons locales. And it's just the nature of war. That is what the Ukrainians are going to do and, and probably any any nation would do, uh, especially in terms of uh, the uh, the capabilities of Russian forces to hit uh, uh, most of these uh, known military sites that have been uh, that have been reduced over the last uh, over the last few months. But uh, that really kind of does it in terms of what we're seeing on the ground right now. Again, we're going to watch this very, very closely in the southeast of Ukraine uh, as the supposed buildup of Ukrainian forces continue. And then obviously we're going to continue uh, to watch the Russian attack towards Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we'll have more very, very soon as we continue our coverage of the Ukrainian and Russian war. Have a good day.